look at these teams that we have coming up on the board, you know, we saw, or we heard rather from Alvin, when he was talking about the people he built with, Robbie was one of these players he called out. So you're going to recognize that team you see on the left. Daiki's team, a little bit different though. Let's have a look at what we've got in there. Tapu Coco, Snorlax, Salamence, Metagross, Clefairy, and Raichu on Robbie's side of the field. That will be the bottom part of your screen versus Daiki's team of Tapu Coco, Arcanine, Tapu Fini, Kartana, Porygon 2, and Gastrodon. Well, Gastrodon is probably the odd one out here and something we've seen in teams but haven't had the chance to touch on so much here. With the pairing that you see on Robbie's team, that Tapu Coco and Raichu that Alvin didn't quite pull off earlier, you have to be looking over towards that Gastrodon to see if that's going to be the Pokemon to answer it. Of course, that fantastic water ground typing is going to be interesting against a team that has no grass type attackers, no Kartana, no Trevenant, no Tapu Bulu coming out from Robbie. So the obvious answer's not in play there. And being able to resist those electric type attacks by basically being immune to them, the best kind of resistance, is going to be something interesting if he can get it into play. Of course, the interesting thing we saw with Gastrodon, particularly this year, is its access to ground type attacking moves such as Earth Power was not there as it had been in previous years. So it usually serves a slightly different purpose. And I'd be curious to see if he brings it, what kind of implementation of Gastrodon we have in that. But going back over to Robbie's team briefly as trainers are about to go in the game, we saw a number of options come out as Alvin played it. And I think Robbie's gonna show off a couple more options. Of course, we've got the Tapu Koko and the Raichu. We've got Salamence and Metagross and then Snorlax and Clefairy. So there's three very established pairings in there that also blend very nicely across pairings as well. Tapu Koko and Kartana out on Daiki's side of the field versus the Raichu and Tapu Koko combination on Robbie's side of the field. Raichu loving the electric terrain that just has been set up. Yeah, no doubt that there's going to be electric terrain in play. And Daiki's faced with a very interesting situation here. If he wants to get rid of the electric terrain and nullify the activation of the Surge Surfer ability from Robbie's side, he has to bring in Tapu Fini. Bringing in Tapu Fini against two electric type attackers is not the way to be going about it. It's going to get knocked out fairly easily. So a lot of offensive pressure, I think, from Robbie's side of the field. Both the Pokemon on his side are going to be quicker than this Kartana and definitely provide a number of ways to try and knock it out. The Tapu Koko, not so scared of the electric type attacks, but still in a good position, I think, to do something as Raichu opens up with an interesting one. Hidden power to the Kartana for the knockout. A great start for Robbie, taking an immediate 4-3 lead, but Daiki wanting to get in on a little bit of action of his own, going straight for that Electrium Z on the Tapu Koko. Well, we did have have a, a slide up before this showing the use of Z crystals. So the Electrium Z was much higher than it had been at any point in the season. Gigavolt Havoc, though, an electric type Z move isn't going to be the most effective use, but going into Robbie's Tapu Coco here, taking it very, very oh. low. Not enough for the knockout, though, due to it being not very effective. Tapu Coco finishing up this turn with a dazzling gleam, just leaving the opposing Tapu Coco barely hanging on. Yeah, well, you have to look at how the damage was done there. Both players, I mean, a knockout on the Kartana is huge, and that's information that Daiki's gonna be able to take into games two and potentially three. But the way they exchange damage on the Tapu Koko is very interesting. The Electrium Z fell a little bit short of that knockout and actually left Robbie's Tapu Koko with, you know, amount of health similar to what we got left with on Daiki's Tapu Koko after a single attack from Robbie's. The Dazzling Gleam, single target, obviously getting a bit of a buff, but he didn't give up a Z move to do that. And that's something that I think Robbie may be able to capitalize on. Now he still has that in there. If he can pull it out at the right time, he's going to be able to really keep the momentum going in his favor. Yes, that Arcanine taking the field for the Kartana, going to uh, use its Intimidate to lower the attack stat of both Pokemon on Robbie's side of the field. Not that big of a deal. Tapu Koko switching out for the Clefairy on Robbie's side as Tapu Koko on Daiki's side of the field goes for Protect. And there is the second Z move of the game, this time coming from that adorable Alolan Raichu. Stoked Spark Surfer is one of the Z moves I was so excited about when they first announced it. And to finally see it in play at the world stage is so good. It's an adaptation of the electric Z move, but it does a little bit more than Gigavolt Havoc. We are going to see that Z move heading towards this Arcanine. In the electric terrain, Arcanine is able to cling on. 
But the guaranteed paralysis from Stoke Spark Surfer makes it a little bit harder, even after this recovery from the Aya Papa Berry. Flare Blitz from that Arcanine going to crash into the Alolan Raichu on Robbie's side of the field, almost knocking out, but not quite. And that is the end of turn two. So much has happened so far in the Both game. Both the Z-moves exchanged without taking a knockout. So it does show that although these Pokemon are powerful, both these trainers know what can and can't take these hits comfortably. Now the Tapu Koko on Daiki's side, I think is in a little bit of trouble because the Raichu is still capitalizing on that Surge Surfer ability. But the Raichu really has its pick of the litter right here in what it wants to take out. If it goes for Tapu Koko, it'll get it. If it goes for Arcanine, it'll get it too. And this is gonna be the most important important turn, I think, for Robbie to make sure his Raichu takes a knockout. If he can do it, the momentum just keeps going in his favor. And Clefairy may be able to buy that Raichu even more time if there's a mistake with a potential follow me. Clefairy could use follow me. Sometimes trainers will also use it in more of a supportive role. I don't think its ability friend guard makes as much of a difference. Protect, though, is a move that I don't think you ever see on Clefairy as Arcanine uses a extreme speed to knock out the Raichu. Well, that's an interesting one. Seeing the Raichu go down like that is something that Robbie was looking to capitalize on, but he's got the information guaranteed that it is one of the Arcanines with extreme speed. Clefairy, though, wanted to make sure it was on the field for that classic partner, the Snorlax. Snorlax is really able to capitalize off friend guard so much better. And if this Snorlax on Robbie's side of the field has high horsepower, then it could be in a great position. That's gonna be super effective against Tapu Koko, super effective against Arcanine. And this Arcanine is paralyzed, so he may actually be able to move before it, especially because he comes from that group who have been running this very, very fast Snorlax. So excited to see how things will break down here. Clefairy starting the turn off with a follow me. It will become the center of attention and prevent Snorlax from taking any single target hits while it remains on the field. Thunderbolt from that ta Tapu Koko into the Clefairy and Snorlax moving faster than the Arcanine thanks to that paralysis will cut its own health in half to maximize its attack power and immediately get that health back thanks to its Pinch Berry, the Ayapapa Berry in this case. Flare Blitz from the Arcanine will connect with that Clefairy as well. Yes, that Clefairy taking a lot of damage, but sticking around, a burn coming in there, will make sure that it gets knocked out within a couple of turns. We get the first tick of damage there, and it is gonna have two more turns, assuming it can protect itself. So that's interesting to know, but I think Clefairy's done its job. It's bought the time by, even without using Follow Me, becoming a focal point of this team with Protect, and now Snorlax is still in a really good position. It's got the belly drum up. It's faster than Arcanine, and all Clefairy needs to do now is draw Tapu Koko's attack over to it with a potential follow me, and then it will be in a good position to start playing around this. Arcanine protecting itself this turn. Clefairy going for a second follow me, again becoming the center of attention and again protecting its buddy Snorlax. Tapu Koko though not falling for it, instead going for a Dazzling Gleam so that it is able to attack both of the Pokemon on Robbie's side of the field. Snorlax finishing this turn off with a return targeting down Ooh. that Arcanine as the electric terrain disappears from the field. That is not what Robbie wanted with the potential from follow me. Even if the Dazzling Gleam came out, you had Friend Guard in play to try and keep Snorlax safe. And the one thing that really interests me is that he didn't go after the Tapu Koko. Knowing the Arcanine is moving after him, I think the Tapu Koko was much more of a threat there. And he had to look at that. Returning the Arcanine is great if you hit it, but it protected. And maybe he wasn't expecting that to come out, but Tapu Koko being the faster thing on the field, especially with your own Tapu Koko in the back, we saw, of course, in game, uh, in turn one of this game, that Daiki's Tapu Koko actually moved first. So I think not taking out that Tapu Koko is going to give Daiki a little more breathing room to get back into this game as long as he can start taking some knockouts. The Snorlax is still a threat, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, you know, if he can take out the Tapu Koko, then he ends up in an awkward 3v1 situation. Well, if anybody can win a 3v1 situation, it's going to be a Snorlax that has its attack max out. Extreme speed to knock out the Tapu Koko on Robbie's side of the field as Daiki's Tapu Koko goes for another Dazzling Gleam to attack the Snorlax. Snorlax firing off a return, this time into the Tapu Koko, and will get that knockout. Yes, it does get the knockout, and it's really interesting to see the way Daiki's using this Arcanine. Bringing extreme speed means he's able to pick up knockouts that not always would have been able to be bought out. We do see Daiki's fourth Pokemon, and it is going to be that Gastrodon. 
Gastrodon's a really interesting Pokemon, I think, for this matchup. It's known to be very defensive. Uh, might want to try and set something up with a stockpile or something, but in this case, I think Daiki really needs it to attack. But it's not even able to take that hugely powerful return from the Snorlax. It knocks it out, and Arcanine misses Ooh. the Will-O-Wisp. Just one turn too late, it seems, on that. Yes, I do have to wonder about the Gastrodon, what it bought, and now we see the Snorlax will, of course, be moving first for the Arcanine, so just for any doubt, it's going to be Robbie's game one. But just an interesting thing, you know, he made it a little bit harder for himself, I think, than he could. And that's some kind of information he can take into game two. Maybe keep that momentum going that he got from something like the big stoked spark surfer. So a very quick game, only a little over 10 minutes for that game, all in. And Robbie taking game one very comfortably. I want to go back to Gastrodon, though. The way Gastrodon's been played, as you said, is defensive. But I want to know if it has an answer to Snorlax and its move pool because it's been limited without that option for something like the uh, the Earth Power. It has to look to Fisher if it wants a ground type move, which isn't so effective. You have to wonder if Gastrodon has maybe something to deal with Snorlax. It's got some interesting tech moves I've seen throughout this year. It's a good question. Hopefully going into this game too, Daiki will bring it a little bit sooner so we can see just what he was thinking when he picked his Gastrodon in the past team preview. I don't think it's going to be something like Fisher though because it seems like it's a very inconsistent move. You only have about 25% well, of a chance for that knockout. Well, it was used for uh, turning it into Groundium or using this Groundium Z to turn it into Tectonic Rage. It was an interesting one. The one thing, now we've seen that last Pokemon on Daiki's team, you do have to wonder, why did Gastrodon stay in the back till late when there was electric types on the field? And that turn, in particular, where Stoke Spark Surfer hit Arcanine, in this game, if that's the style that Robbie decides to revisit, is there going to be a prediction from Daiki to try and get that in as quickly as possible? Maybe take that Stoke Spark Surfer and it's just going to be not useful. You're not going to get any value out of your Z-Move when you resist it and you're immune to it entirely. That would certainly change the course of how that game went with Arcanine. Honestly, as long as Arcanine isn't even paralyzed and it can move faster than the Snorlax, something like a Will-O-Wisp could be a huge advantage to Daiki in stopping just the threat of the Belly Drum and that maximized attack. Yes, I think... Uh, a good point from you there that you know we didn't see the will o wisp early yes he was picking up knockouts with extreme speed but i think kind of putting the thumb over that snorlax trying to keep it in check a little bit more would have been a slightly easier way to go or maybe getting that burn down even earlier that's something that he has to look at it is hard after you're paralyzed but you've got to try it otherwise snorlax is going to run through your team and if the will o wisp had connected maybe Gastrodon would have been able to stick around and do good work. Well, if Daiki's going for a Will-O-Wisp again, now is the time with that Arcanine and Tapu Koko out on the field. Robbie again leading that Alolan Raichu alongside Tapu Koko of his own. Well, this was one of the most hyped combinations coming into the release of Pokemon Sun Moon. Of course, Alolan Raichu was basically told you need to be partnered up with a Tapu Koko to do well. And it seems to be coming around towards the end of the year in a very, very strong and positive fashion. So I'd love to see what it does. Arcanine's already on the field. It didn't get any value out of its Intimidate either. We see that on the site, you know, Intimidate's used to lower attack stats, but both these Pokemon on Robbie's side rely on their special attack. So I feel like if he's gonna get Arcanine out of the field, maybe try and get that Gastronon in to take a Stoke Spark Surfer. Now would be a good time, so he's got Intimidate for a little bit later. And I think coming from that point, you know, Raichu is going to be a little more careful. I think Robbie's going to hold fire on a Stoke Spark surface till he sees a potential switch. Yes, but you also have to wonder, will Daiki go for his Z-move uh, right away as well? Because we did see that last time. Not going to see it now. Uh, Gastrodon taking the spot of the Tapu Koko on Daiki's side of the field as Arcanine uses Protect to ensure that it will not take full damage from a Z-move. Raichu with the Fake Out into the Gastrodon and Tapu Koko with the Thunderbolt into the Gastrodon as well. Yeah, trying to double up into that slot, remove the Tapu Koko from play so the only electric types are coming out from Robbie's side of the field. But we do see the Gastrodon is in play already. So this Arcanine could be potentially targeted down by the Stoke Spark Surfer. And if there was something like a Dazzling Gleam to follow up, that might be enough damage to get it there. With the Tapu Koko moving second though, Stoke Spark Surfer would activate the Berry, paralyze it, and then it would still be sticking around. But 
You do have to wonder if he thinks Tapu Koko is valuable here. Not quite in this case. Snorlax taking the field in place of that Tapu Koko. Raichu with the Encore, locking that Arcanine into using Protect for the next several turns. So Arcanine unable to attack. Gastrodon finishing this turn up with a Scald into that Snorlax slot. Doesn't deal a lot of damage, does not get a burn. Doesn't get what it was looking for. Fishing for a burn and not quite getting it. But overall, I think Raichu showing off why it's useful. There's so much more to it than Stoke Spark Surfer and Fake Out. We saw the hidden power in game one that was absolutely essential and revealing that final move in Encore. Yeah, Encore, I think, is one of Raichu's probably more signature moves, being able to take advantage of his boost's speed from the terrain and capitalize on situations like this where a Pokemon will use Protect, then, then you can lock it in. Well, it's done its work, and it's leaving, and again, Snorlax being put on the field next to Clefairy with that ever-present friend guard. Arcanine leaving the field as well, Tapu Koko taking its place. Snorlax more than happy to do what it does best and use that Belly Drum to boost its attack, maximize its attack, even and consume that pinch berry to bring its health right back up. Gastrodon again with a scald, again going to target down that snorlax. A burn would be great here. Burn, but it does Ooh. not get it. It's gotta be fishing for it. And getting Gastrodon in earlier is another way to try and get that burn out. Something I really think is a good adaptation. The problem is he has let Snorlax set up again, and Snorlax is next to its friend Clefairy, going to be assisted by the friend guard. There's other moves Clefairy has to keep Snorlax around. And, you know, with the team we saw earlier, the Snorlax doesn't have access to its berry over and over again. Putting Tapu Koko in front of a Snorlax with high horsepower, especially after a belly drum, is a big old risk. Clefairy with the follow me, taking the Z move from Daiki. It looks like he's going again for that Gigavolt Havoc from that Tapu Koko. It's in electric terrain, so it's going to be doing a lot of damage. But it's not targeting a premium a threat from Robbie's side of the field. Yes, it will be going towards Clefairy. It will be really, really nice, of course, to remove that friend guard from play. But you have to wonder. Is that the Pokemon you really wanted to be targeting? You are going to fall short of the knockout, and Snorlax, the quick Snorlax moving before Gastrodon, free to just slap it with that big return. Yeah, no more Scalds for Gastrodon. Unfortunately, if Daiki wants to try and burn that Snorlax, he might have to do it the old-fashioned way with a Will-O-Wisp. Yeah, bringing Arcanine in. The Intimidate is uh, not quite going to get there. You've got about six stages to wear through, so you've got one of six. You're getting there. Um, you do have to wonder about the Gastrodon. It didn't seem so useful, but now Arcanine coming in may be a little bit better, but again, Clefairy showing another reason it's so useful, pulling a Z move away in this instance, keeping that Snorlax so, so safe. It's been so good in this team that we've seen from Robbie, from Alvin, and a couple of their other friends, that you have to wonder, is it going to be a dominating team tomorrow? Well, for now, Clefairy certainly will remain probably the dominating target of this game as it uses Follow Me to redirect a Volt Switch from that Tapu Koko into itself, knocking itself out, out in the process. So Arcanine, if uh, Daiki did decide to target that Snorlax, now would be the time to try and use will -Wisp, hope that it connects, and hope that you get that burn on the Snorlax. Cartana taking the place for the Tapu Koko. There's the will -Wisp. It will connect with the Snorlax. It's going to help. It's going to help. Even though Snorlax is still at five stages of raised attack, the burn will lower it slightly. Uh, Cartana resists normal type attacks, definitely. So uh, that will -Wisp already paying off in dividends. Yeah, that will -Wisp really, really helping out. And we do, of course, see, I just think, very smart play there from Daiki to get Kartana in with the Volts, which is really, really nice. And, of course, Kartana's in a, a decent enough position. Interestingly enough, the Raichu isn't affected by Surge Surfer right now. So it's not getting that double speed, and it's not going to be able to hit and power fire quickly. But because it's been brought back onto the field, this is its first turn in play, does have access to that fake out, and that's another way to buy Snorlax time to do what it needs to do. Snorlax is on a bit of a clock, the burn wearing it down, no recovery options anymore, no potential heal pulses from Clefairy, no recycles on this particular variant of Snorlax. Maybe Daiki's gonna have to slow this game down, but Robbie's gonna be able to basically get at least one turn of attacking in because of the fake out, or at least a turn of forcing the protect from Daiki. 
It'll be interesting to see which Pokemon Robbie decides to target with that fake out. You know, Kartana gets access to fighting type moves that Arcanine is free to attack, but no fake out at all. Instead, Sacred Sword into the Snorlax. It's super effective, but Snorlax is able to hang on. Hidden Power Fire from that Alolan Raichu for the knockout onto the Kartana. It's all down to this Arcanine and this Snorlax. Arcanine with the Flare Blitz going to crash into the Alolan Raichu to knock it out. And Snorlax Snorlax will be able to attack this turn, but will get knocked out from the burn damage. Will it be able to do enough damage with that high horsepower to knock out that Arcanine as well? And it does. Ooh. So at the end of the turn, we're left with no Pokemon standing on the field. Even with that burn in play, Arcanine really got more than it bargained for with that high horsepower. It was so much damage, and the field completely cleared at the end of this turn. It's going to come down to a really tight end game. Robbie sending out his Tapu Koko at full health. Daiki sending out his Tapu Koko also at full health. So Tapu Koko versus Tapu Koko. I think you talked a little bit about this matchup earlier. We might know which one could be faster than the other Tapu Koko. So could come down to the items that these Tapu Koko are holding. It really could. And I'm so excited to see how this one pans out. We saw the Dazzling Gleam from the previous game not quite get the knockout, but Daiki's moving first, and that's essential. Dazzling Gleam, Dazzling Gleam from both Tapu Koko, but Daiki's Tapu Koko is left with just a sliver of health. Robbie's Tapu Koko is left with approximately half of its health. The he moves again first. One more Dazzling Gleam going first. It connects with the Tapu Koko, and it gets the knockout. Daiki tying up this game, bringing us into a game Three. Yes, those mirror matches between the Tapu Koko. Robbie can't take that again in game three. Every single turn we saw them facing off when they were both on the field, the speed tier was, of course, moving so that Daiki's Tapu Koko moved beforehand. And that was so essential in that late game, forcing us to a game three. Their tournament live is on the line, and with the set tied at one and one it's basically a best of one. Now, there is a crucial piece of information I'd like to bring to the fore based on that game, too. The amount of damage the Tapu Koko did to each other, Robbie's did significantly more, and it moved afterwards. That could be an indication not only of the item, but of the potential nature on Robbie's Tapu Koko. A lot of people, when they try and boost it with the choice specs, just go modest and go all in on the offense. But with the Tapu Koko on Daiki's side moving first, yes, a little less damage, but a lot quicker. And that's something that paid off for him there. So with this game coming down to essentially what is a best of one, do you think these trainers have any more tricks up their sleeves to try and win this game? If there's a team I feel has tricks up its sleeves, I'd look towards Robbie's because we haven't seen all of the options of it. I don't really agree that Salamence or Metagross are the particularly strong player here, but I think it comes down to how they lead. And Daiki really picked up on a key piece of information there. The fact that the Raichu could beat his Kartana, we learned that in game one with the hidden power, he then ended up in a very unique position, which we don't often see usually when you have both the Pokemon, where Raichu went for the Hidden Power, it didn't fake out, and Kartana was free to throw a Sacred Sword towards that Snorlax. The Sacred Sword brought it in range to get knocked out by the Burn. The Burn also very important, so a number of the things that came out from Daiki in that game were the defining factor. I feel he was in the driving seat for his victory. That is so important. That confidence boost as you come into game three with your tournament life hanging in the balance is so essential. This game could not be more exciting. Robbie again leading the combination of the Alolan Raichu and the Tapu Koko versus Daiki's lead again of that Arcanine and that Tapu Koko. Well, the one thing we didn't see from Robbie in that last game was stoked Spark Surfer. He didn't manage to get it out, and you have to wonder if he's going to try and weave it in again. Instead of encoring something into the Protect in the last game, it was the Arcanine. Maybe just try and get it in a position where it's paralyzed again. We did see the Stoke Spark Surfer falls short of the knockout, but because it was paralyzed when Snorlax came in, a much better position for Snorlax. And I'd like to see him use that. That's so important to these games. Using your Z-Move effectively. I've been harping on about it all year. It can win or lose you a game. 
Well, if he's going to make the play, now is the time. First, a fake out from that Raichu into the Tapu Koko, preventing it from moving this turn, allowing Robbie's Tapu Koko to use Volt Switch to give him an opportunity to switch that Tapu Koko into something else that he brought on his team. Well, interestingly, we didn't see Arcanine Protect, and we actually saw in the previous turn, or the previous game, that Flare Blitz got the knockout on Alolan Raichu. With the Clefairy coming in, though, because of the Volt Switch, it could fall short, and Robbie, mulling over the damage calculation. Friend Guard coming in clutch. Friend Guard allowing Raichu to hold on for one turn. The recoil from that Flare Blitz activating Arcanized Pinchberry as well. That's so good. That Friend Guard showing why it's an ability you need to bring. Clefairy has to have the Eevee Light, but it does so much work. And now, if he wants to go for Stoke Spark Surfer on the Arcanine, he's pretty much guaranteed the knockout to do that. Clefairy can draw away the Z-move from Daiki's Tapu Koko if it's coming. He can draw away anything from the Tapu Koko. So that's really, really important. He does have to watch out for potential extreme speed if maybe he's trying to do something a little bit clever. Clefairy, though, going for Protect. This is going to be huge. Arcanine with the extreme speed targeting down that Raichu, looking for a knockout, and it gets it. Tapu Koko left on Daiki's side of the field, going for the Z move, going to be able to damage that Clefairy through its protect. It's going to be helpful getting some damage down, but the most important thing is Raichu is out without using its Z move. So both these players not getting maximum value out of their Z move, but Daiki getting something out of it, and something is usually better than nothing. In this case, it's going to be a bit of chip damage, but every little bit helps, especially when you need to get rid of the Clefairy for fear of a potential Snorlax coming in. It's much better than the last time where, of course, Follow me the full damage attack, but Clefairy's going to be around to help out its pal Snorlax. I do think that that's going to be what's coming in. feel very confidently that that's going to be the play. The high horsepower, super effective against both of these, probably feeling like he can get another belly drum in as well. You have to wonder, though, with so much on the line, if using a term to uh, belly drum would be the right play. Instead, <laughs> Robbie sending in that Tapu Koko. Yeah, he must feel good about his Tapu Koko. Uh, with the damage it can do, based on the item speculation of, of the choice specs, Arcanine is probably in range to get knocked out very comfortably by a Thunderbolt and Electric Terrain. Clefairy again, keep it partner safe, pulling a Thunderbolt over towards it. So Tapu Koko's probably feeling good. That forces Daiki to use Dazzling Gleam, which, as we saw, wasn't quite enough with that Tapu Koko. So Clefairy leaving. His friend Snorlax coming in a little bit early. Yeah, Snorlax maybe not afraid of taking a Will-O-Wisp from that Arcanine. First, it, it will be the target of a Thunderbolt from Daiki's Tapu Koko. Thunderbolt from Robbie's Tapu Koko will be enough to knock out that Arcanine. So that is one last Pokemon that can burn the Snorlax and possibly puts Robbie one step closer to moving on till tomorrow. It really does. Getting rid of that Arcanine, the burn was, I think, what really swung the game back for Daiki in the previous game, in game two. And being able to remove that from play is so important. The interesting thing to note, though, is we did see a good amount of damage come down from the Tapu Koko's Thunderbolt, and Snorlax could be perilously close to being caught by a Sacred Sword. That's something it has to worry about if there's a critical hit, for example. We know Kartana loves critical hits. Usually it's the Scope Lens version, but that's something he has to go for. We see Robbie, a little bit of a uh, side note there, he tries to change up his move, maybe wanting to get Tapu Koko out with a Volt Switch, and he reveals to us on the bottom screen the Choice Specs is confirmed, and he's stuck Thunderbolting. So this Kartana may feel a little better about it in comparison to some other things. Might want to switch to something to try and hit the Tapu Koko a little bit better. I think Daiki's Kartana here is going to be very, very crucial in what it does in this turn and this turn alone. Snorlax leaving the field for now. That Clefairy taking its place. Uh, Robbie not ready to have that Snorlax possibly be knocked out. And Kartana outspeeding the Tapu Koko on both sides of the field with a Smart Strike into Robbie's Tapu Koko. Daiki following that up with a Thunderbolt into the Tapu Koko, but it's not enough to knock it out. Tapu Koko on Robbie's side of the field left Thunderbolting into that Kartana. It's not enough when you've got Friend Guard in play. The power of friendship coming through in the last round of day one at the Pokemon World Championships. Tapu Koko sticking around, gonna have another turn to Thunderbolt something. Clefairy coming into play, able to pull some attacks over, but with the Kartana moving before both the Tapu Koko, there's only one option. It's got a Choice Scarf, 
and it's locked into a pretty nasty Smart Strike. Smart Strike is not something Clefairy wants to pull towards it. Not at all. So Clefairy may be forced into a Protect. If it goes Follow Me, it's in trouble. And I think this is probably the time you don't want Clefairy. Maybe forced to switch it out for a Snorlax and get it back in when Snorlax is in play. This Kartana with the Choice Scarf is putting so much pressure down on Robbie. If he switches out the Clefairy though, Tapu Koko is so easy to knock out. Well, Clefairy will use Protect this turn, not switching out, leaving Tapu Koko right next to it on its own. Smart Strike from the Kartana will target down that Tapu Koko for that knockout. So Tapu Koko left on Daiki's side of the field to attack into that Clefairy after Kartana gets the attack beast boost. Well, the Clefairy is sticking around now. Is going to be one of Robbie's last two Pokemon. And it's going to be facing down a beast boosted in attack Kartana with Smart Strike. That's going to be a, a rough old time for Clefairy. So that Kartana isn't going to have to switch out and change its move up if it feels good about being able to hit this Clefairy. That no Pokemon can switch on Robbie's side of the field. So the Tapu Koko is one of the things he's going to want to take to deal with Snorlax. And he just has to feel good about his remaining Pokemon that he can get the knockout with that. Clefairy follow me -ing a big move from Kartana its way. Clefairy trying to protect Snorlax from the Smart Strike from that Tapu Koko on Daiki's side of the field, but Ooh. it is unable to hold on. Kartana's Smart Strike will knock it out. It's all up to the Snorlax now to keep Robbie's World Championship dream alive. Tapu Koko with that Volt Switch will connect with the Snorlax, bring it down to just below half of its health, consuming its only bear and giving Daiki a chance to switch out that Tapu Koko and bring it back with the electric terrain. Now, something else is important to note as well is it is going to be getting out of the way of a potential high horsepower. So whatever comes in, the Gastrodon showing itself for another round here. You know, the Snorlax does go for high horsepower, is connecting with Kartana, and it is oh. not enough for the knockout. Falling short, Robbie extending the hand, knowing that his day is coming to an end. This Gastrodon is so interesting. It hasn't really done much in any of these games, yet just the fact that it's around, it's able to take hits and provide sort of a uh, defensive pivot, if you will, yes. for Daiki's team has been huge Ooh. throughout this game as Smart Strike from that Kartana almost knocks out the Snorlax. Snorlax finally able to knock out the that Kartana with a return, and Gastrodon left on the field to use Clear Smog. That's the move that I really wanted it to bring out, showing off that Clear Smog. That's why I was talking about it so much. Once you belly drum, if you get Clear Smogged immediately after, then you're not getting any benefits. It removes those stat changes. I think that was something that he bought it for. That's why it turned up every single game. Of course, poor Snorlax is stuck there with no way to recover. Tapu Koko's come back in the electric terrain. So this looks like the end of the road for Robbie. A fantastic game one, but the reverse sweep from Daiki in games two and three will send another Japanese representative to day two of the Pokemon World Championships. Yeah, so congratulations to Daiki. Congratulations to Robbie. Getting yourself to your one win away from moving on in the World Championships is definitely an amazing accomplishment. Yes, it really, really is. And I think he's going to rue a couple.